Today from the Global Lane, scientists in San Francisco secretly seed clouds to reduce global warming. Could the experiments cause climate chaos? When we do these things, we should look at uh, the Hippocratic Oath, they first do no harm. What are the consequences of this are potentially catastrophic. Some of America's biggest cities make a big U-turn on their lax crime and drug laws. They could have done this from the beginning. Uh, and, you know, we're supposed to forget about the tens of thousands of people who have died at the hands of violent criminals. In Washington state, an elementary school allows a pride club but rejects a proposed interfaith prayer group. Unfortunately, I believe it's, it's just not the right diversity and inclusion. And an electoral college end run in Maine. And it's all right here on the Global Lane. Climate scientists in California are secretively seeding clouds from a decommissioned aircraft carrier in hopes of reducing global warming. The method is known as marine cloud brightening, and it raises concerns about adverse weather manipulation. We're here to explain to CO2 Coalition Executive Director Gregory Wrightstone. Gregory, I guess it isn't secretive because it's been reported by the New York Times, L.A. Times, others in California. So what in the world is going on just outside of San Francisco in Alameda, California? Who are these scientists? Why are they so secretive about what they're doing? Well, they're secretive because, you know, we, when we do these things, we should look at uh, the Hippocratic Oath and first do no harm and uh, that the physicians use. And we have no idea what the unintended consequences are to things like this. We know you can put stuff into the atmosphere, uh, and if you do that, it can block sunlight. And their argument is, well, let's let's put this stuff, uh, the most common thing they, they do are sulfates. Particulate matter can be up there. Um, but, but what are the consequences of this are potentially catastrophic uh, combined. Of course, agriculture production has been breaking records year after year after year. And what do we need for agriculture? We need sunlight, water, and CO2. The more CO2, the better, uh, plus nitrogen fertilizer, which are made from fossil fuels. And so the things they're trying to do to, to forestall a non-existent climate crisis, uh, they want to put this, it's called geoengineering, put things in the atmosphere, uh, block the sunlight, can only harm agriculture. They're trying to reduce carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, which can only harm agriculture. And they're trying to get rid of nitrogen fertilizer, which would be devastating to agriculture. And some of all these efforts uh, could be catastrophic in terms of widespread crop failure, famine, and, and deaths by the millions from, from these consequences. For a long time now, uh, Bill Gates has suggested uh, doing this along with proposing Get this one, and you know about this, positioning giant mirrors in Earth orbit to reflect sunlight. So who's financing these experiments? What are the risks to our climate? Well, with Bill Gates, he doesn't need any help. He's got half the money in the world, I think, he and Jeff Bezos. Uh, but they're, it's, again, we, we don't know, but there are probably significantly bad results that will, that will affect humanity and the human condition. We should, we should oppose these things. Some people think these experiments like this and also cloud seeding have caused California to get drenched with rain and snow this year, several inches above normal. No, 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 no. These are uh, these happen from time to time. And, and they, they, they began long before this. They tried this. It's just a silly little experimentation that they did there with it wouldn't be big enough to make any effect at all. And the, the uh, California, just two years ago, they were talking about the mega mega drought. It would never end. And now the drought's gone. If you look at the drought map, California is, you, there is no drought in California. Uh, before it was climate change is going to kill us because of the drought. Now climate change is going to kill us because of the rain. No, no, no. And if you talk about uh, sea level rise, Mary, it's, it's really interesting. If you look, you know, the most adverse island chain and nation is the, are the Maldives and the Indian Ocean. Um, only 14 feet above sea level is the highest point. Um, but if we look at the Maldives, 15,000 years ago, the Maldives were also just above sea level. And in the last 15,000 years, sea level has risen, get this, 400 feet. 400 feet of sea level rise. 
Why are the Maldives not under 400 feet of water, you might ask? Well, the answer is a geologic process known as accretion, uh, that as sea level rises, the islands grow uh, during storm events, near shore sands and gravels, the remains of the corals and the rest get, get washed up onto the island and then redistributed by the, by the plant and animal life. And at the rate of sea level rise, in two decades, we'll have seen two inches of sea level rise. And what they're telling you is the last 400 feet of sea level rise didn't put the islands under, but that next two inches, look out, they're going to be underwater. No, they're not. It's just, it's just one fake climate crisis after another. Okay, well, there's another one going on. This one, a legal one that has some ramifications. The European Court of Human Rights sided with some Swiss women. A ruling that Switzerland and other governments have an obligation to protect their citizens from the effects of climate change. And that's a precedent-setting ruling linking emissions to human rights. Your thoughts on that one? Well, and they didn't, they didn't fight the facts. They assumed from the start that human emissions uh, were warming the atmosphere and the warming atmosphere was going to lead to catastrophic consequences. Nobody argued the facts. There's the... the facts that we have um, tell a story that's compelling. And that's why they need to silence people like me and the, the compadres and colleagues at the CO2 coalition, because we make a compelling case that's backed up by science, facts, and data. And finally, Greg, we're about to start a new hurricane season here in the Western Hemisphere. 11 hurricanes predicted for this season, five of them major. We're seeing a lot of solar storm activity, solar cycle 25 is now underway through October. So what role does all that play in this? Yeah, well, if you look at the hurricane, I just looked at the hurricane data uh, going back to 1950. The, the, the really good stuff starts in 1979 with, with the uh, satellite data on hurricanes. There's no trend either up or down uh, in the size nor the intensity of hurricanes. You can't just, you can make, it's easy to make predictions uh, you just have to remember that not to look back at what you predicted last year, which was hugely intensive hurricane season, which turned out to be one of the quietest ever. Um, so, you know, they make these predictions, hoping that nobody catches them on it. Uh, they've been wrong with almost every prediction uh, over the last 40 and 50 years of, of these climate catastrophes. Uh, but one thing is true. Uh, they are true when they say you look for named hurricanes, and they will tell you that named hurricanes have been increasing in number. And they, why is that? Because they're naming them earlier. This is a climate of fear. They've done very well advancing this notion of of man-made catastrophic warming. And again, it's just the science doesn't doesn't support it. And you have plenty of it in your new book. Uh, the name again, and where can people get a copy? The name is A Very Convenient Warming. Uh, you can buy it directly from me at convenientwarming.com. Okay, Gregory Wrightstone, thank you for sharing those insights. We appreciate it, as always. Lax policies on crime, homelessness, and drugs have transformed some of America's most desirable cities, causing many residents to flee. The urban plight is so severe that many people claim the cities have become unlivable and resemble third world countries. However, there's good news. More and more cities that once embraced these lax policies are now backtracking and adopting tougher laws. Dale Hurd has the story. When former Portland State philosophy professor Peter Bogosian decided to leave the city he loved, Portland, Oregon, he didn't mince words. Portland is like an open sewer. It's a cesspool. Murder over here, porch pirate over here, car stolen here, dog mutilated over here. The murder rate is up 300%. The homelessness is terrible, addiction. That description fits a number of American cities where residents have moved on due to crime, drugs, tent cities, and trash. Cities like Seattle. I witnessed one individual pull out a knife and start threatening a group of others. Uh, saw the aftermath of one shooting. Los Angeles. And I kid you not, you guys, there were at least five to seven crimes happening every single day. And these crimes weren't like five miles away, 10 miles away. They were all within a mile of where we were living. In San Francisco. 
We saw needles on the floor and urine everywhere. It smells horrible. Everywhere. It's not just like one bad street, right? Or like one bad area. It's everywhere. It's even on the main street. Not one cop in sight, like not at all. I, did you see any cops? Not, we didn't see any cops. Mm -hmm. As more and more people and businesses flee the crime and chaos in some urban areas, city leaders have realized they have to do something. In New York City, the National Guard has been called in to help fight the rampant crime on the city's subways. D.C. just passed a sweeping crime bill that increases penalties for theft and gun crime. San Francisco voters have approved two ballot measures that expand police surveillance and require drug tests for welfare recipients. Former prosecutor uh, Cully on. Stimson asked uh, why it took them so long. What happened in the last three years? Where have those policies been? They could have done this from the beginning. Uh, and, you know, we're supposed to forget about the tens of thousands of people who have died at the hands of violent criminals, the tens of thousands of businesses that have been robbed, the stores that have closed. We're not going to forget because they happened because of these liberal policies. Even the state of Oregon is throwing in the towel on its disastrous drug legalization. When we visited Portland last year, drug counselor Kevin Dahlgren showed us how city and state policies were attracting the drug-addicted homeless from across the country. The homeless have told me, you know, it's very easy to be homeless because we're completely taken care of. We are fed, we are clothed, medical services come right to our tent, people give us anything they want. Oregon has finally decided that becoming the first state to decriminalize hard drugs was not such a good idea and is recriminalizing possession of drugs like heroin, cocaine and fentanyl. And while some leaders may have seen the light on how to save their cities, Stimson says all the policy changes in the world won't help if district attorneys don't get tough on crime. Because the gatekeeper to the criminal justice system are the 2,300 elected DAs around this country. It doesn't matter what the city council passes or the mayor wags his finger about or the governor bloviates about. If the DA isn't going to carry through with the effective enforcement of the law, chaos ensues, and that's what's been happening in these cities. Dale Hurd joins us with more insights. Dale, how did it get to this point, crime-ridden cities where people fear for their lives and property? Was it an overreaction to the George Floyd protests? Yeah, that and part uh, left-wing popularity contest, part ultra-utopianism. I mean, think about it. It, you really, they threw the Ten Commandments in the trash, basically, and, 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 and law. I mean, who, who brought us law? God. And so they don't like law. They don't like law enforcement. They want to believe that people are good. And if you would just take the heavy hand of law off of them, we would have some kind of harmonious society. It's basically turning God's universe that he designed upside down. And shocker, it doesn't work. Well, you reported that homelessness has a lot to do with the higher crime and drug abuse rates. In California, they have about 180,000 homeless on the streets, and that's nearly one-third the homeless popula population of the U.S. So if you first solve homelessness, wouldn't that begin to solve the crime and drug problems? Where, where do these cities start? Yeah, they could try trying to fix it the right way. Portland built really nice houses for the homeless, and what did they do? Most of them trashed the houses and then moved out because they want to be homeless. Then you have Multnomah County in Portland buying tents for the homeless and even putting up empty tents to show them that it's okay to live in a tent here. Okay, this is a multi-layered malfunction by city officials and state officials. I mean, you also have the whole with Portland. It, it became a magnet for drug abusers before they changed their state law. People were migrating to Oregon so they could do their drugs in an easier way. So, yeah, it would be great if we had the right solutions to these, which I think you would agree begin with taking care of some of the mental health problems. Getting, I mean, I walked through Portland and saw a crazy person just about every block, sometimes half-dressed, shouting, raising their hands. They obviously had a broken brain or, or, or they were on drugs. And these people need mental health care, and they're not getting it. Well, it seems like they're enabling drug abuse and mental illness. We don't have uh, mental institutions anymore. They've shut them all down. So although some city councils, maybe even prosecutors, 
are backing off a bit on their lax approach. They haven't really changed their views, have they? Uh, they want to get elected. So why won't they admit these are failed policies? You know, remind me of the communists behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. You know, they could have, they, they saw their societies were failing. They saw their systems didn't work. They could have changed, and yet they couldn't change because they weren't going to become a capitalist. They were communist. And what are these people going to do? Say Donald Trump was right? I mean, that's what's in the back of their mind. They're trapped by their ideologies. And so they're kind of doing the go slow approach back toward the kind of policing that we've always done that's needed to keep people safe. Okay, Dale Hurd, another excellent enterprising report. People are unlikely to see anywhere else. Thank you for sharing those additional insights. We appreciate it. Sure. Do you remember football coach Joe Kennedy? The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that his firing from the Bremerton, Washington School District was unconstitutional after he led prayers on the field following games. However, now an 11-year-old girl named Laura has been denied permission to start an interfaith prayer club at Creekside Elementary in Sammamish, Washington. Laura wanted to start the club because she felt alone in the classroom, but her application was rejected. I had some friends and I knew some other people that felt the same way. And so I talked to them and I was just like, you know what, it would be a great idea to make a club where people could come together and do good in the community. And so that's kind of, that was kind of the idea of my faith, an interfaith prayer club. Well, joining us with more is Campus Reform Higher Education Fellow Attorney Ken Tashi. Ken, I understand this preteens prayer club was rejected, yet the school allows an LGBTQ pride club. Tell us more about this story. Yes, Gary, thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, I also want to emphasize that, that this was an interfaith prayer group. Um, so it wasn't a, a prayer group that was isolated or limited to one religion. This student's interest was to bring together uh, students of, of varied backgrounds and varied faiths to discuss their faith, share their faiths, and to pray together. And um, I would suggest that that probably is the, the strongest form of diversity and inclusion that you'd want to see in our schools, particularly our public schools. But unfortunately, I believe it's, it's just not the right diversity and inclusion. Well, it seems like it's inclusion for everyone ex except for Christians or people who want to pray. The school says, well, they don't have the budget. Laura said if money's the issue, she'll raise the funds to support the club. So don't school officials believe in religious liberty, the First Amendment? I'm sure this girl wouldn't want to force anyone to join the club, neither would the school district. So what's the issue here? Yeah, it, I ultimately don't think it's, it has anything to do with money. This has to do with the school's decision to support secular groups, um, like a, a pride group for students, like a climate change group for students at this school, but then to directly deny uh, the same rights that this religious or this faith-based group is owed under the First Amendment. Uh, this group has rights of free speech. It has rights of uh, freedom of religion and freedom of association. And the school's efforts here directly violate those rights. Well, how about higher institutions of learning, Ken? We're still seeing plenty of discrimination, violations of constitutionally protected freedoms on college and university campuses. Any recent in incidents that uh, concern you right now? What and where? Well, there's a whole host of incidents. Uh, and a, a couple of things, for example, um, you've got uh, the, the largest, one of the largest fines issued against a higher educational institution at Grand Canyon University. Um, that is the largest Christian university in the country. Uh, it was just fined almost $40 million for allegedly lying uh, about its doctoral programs, uh, when at the same time, uh, many other institutions that have similar uh, findings against them, or even in some cases, much more egregious uh, circumstances, have been fined much less. Uh, for example, at Michigan State University, there was a finding over a series of years that has systematically failed to address sexual harassment and sexual assaults on their campus. And they were only fined approximately $4 million. Um, so that's a real concern, whether there is a targeting out there, whether it be at the elementary, secondary ed level or at the higher ed level. And I might also add that currently the Biden administration's Department of Education is looking to withdraw federal regulations that protect faith-based groups in higher education. And the rationale is that they say that enforcing those regulations against college and universities that are denying faith-based groups their rights 
is unduly burdensome on the Department of Education, which sounds a little bit backwards, I would say. And state legislators are pushing back, though, in Missouri. House Bill 1518 would stop discrimination on state colleges and universities. So tell us about that. Why is the human rights campaign uh, condemning that legislation? Well, the, the legislation in Missouri is very similar to 17 other states that have passed, at this point, legislation protecting faith-based groups. Um, and, it, and it runs in line with the existing federal regulations that were established in 2020, which, which again, protect faith-based groups. Um, but what, uh, what some groups argue or allege is that its intent is actually to discriminate against um, LGBT students who may not espouse the faith-based uh, beliefs that the groups, that these faith-based or religious groups would like to start. Um, you know, and, and the, the one thing is clear, that uh, no one has a right to demand or force you to associate with someone who you don't want to associate with. So uh, many of these faith-based organizations want to establish membership or leadership requirements, um, which say, in essence, that as a leader or a member of this group, you're actually going to believe in the faith doctrines of the group. It doesn't sound like a particularly novel idea, uh, but nonetheless, uh, th these are the claims that are made against faith-based groups to try to cancel them out on campus. Okay, Ken Tashi, Campus Reform Education Fellow. Ken, I'm sure Campus Reform will stay on top of these and others, and thank you for setting us straight today. We appreciate it. Gary, thank you very much for your time. This week, the state of Maine passed a new election law that gives the state's four electoral college votes to the presidential candidate who wins the national popular vote. This move is an unconstitutional bypass of the electoral college system, which could potentially nullify the will and influence of Maine voters. Folks, Maine has fewer than one million registered voters, while Los Angeles County alone in California has four times that number. Under Maine's new law, voters in California could potentially overturn the will of voters in Maine. This law undermines election integrity and could prevent voters in smaller states from influencing national election outcomes. It's important to keep an eye out for similar laws in other states. Well, that's it today from the Global Lane. Follow us on the CBN News and NRB channels, YouTube, Spotify, and Rumble. And until next time, be blessed.